Welcome to Echocardiography Lecture Series. Aortic valve regurgitation assessment and proper quantification are very important and critical. In this lecture, we will learn how to approach aortic valve regurgitation. So let's begin. This is aortic valve part two lecture. We were going to discuss uh, aortic regurgitation, the etiology, and quantification of aortic regurgitation. Starting with the etiology. Etiology can be either leaflet abnormalities or aortic root abnormalities. Each one of them is further subdivided into congenital or acquired. In congenital leaflet abnormalities, so we have abnormal numbers of the leaflets like bicuspid uh, or unicuspid or quadricuspid. In acquired, we have inflammation like a rheumatic uh, valve uh, disease, infective endocarditis, even uh, senile degeneration, etc. Root can be also congenital uh, that we see in uh, uh, collagen vascular disease like in Marfan syndrome, osteogenesis imperfecta, ehlers danlos disease. Also, it can be acquired due to uh, simply hypertension uh, related aortic dilatation or uh, maybe dissection or aortitis that we see it in cephalic, cephalous disease or maybe takayasu. Knowing the mechanism of aortic regurgitation is very important, particularly in decision for repair versus replacement. So if, if we have simple aortic dilatation that cause aortic regurgitation, Repair here is preferred compared if we have leaflet abnormalities where repair is usually uh, not uh, possible. So if we have a dilated aortic root or the mechanism of aortic regurgitation is dilatation, we will find a normal leaflet motion like here. Also, if we go to the next slide, we will see that the jet direction is central so we have a central centrally directed jet again indicating that maybe the uh, mechanism here is uh, dilatation of the aortic root also in case of dilatation of aortic root if we look at uh, the aortic valve in short axis we will see like a central coaptation defect here and if we run it, we will see uh, the aortic regurgitation jet is coming from that defect. Now we'll proceed to severity grading. And in severity grading, uh, we can do semi-quantitative assessment or quantitative assessment. In semi-quantitative assessment, we will use the 2D and M mode. Also, we will use Doppler. And in Doppler, there is a color Doppler, there is PW Doppler, and there is continuous wave Doppler. So we will see now each one of them, how we semi-quantitatively assess aortic regurgitation. Starting with the 2D assessment, we will look at the aortic valve anatomy. If there is any obvious pathology, like here we can see also there is a malcoaptation here. In chronic severe aortic regurgitation, we know that aortic regurgitation will cause volume overload uh, on the LV, so we expect the LV to be dilated. So LV dimensions, systolic and diastolic, are important uh, factors to consider in assessing aortic regurgitation. Also, LV function after a while of severe aortic regurgitation the LV systolic function will be impaired. Now going from 2D to M mode, if we have a severe aortic regurgitation or significant aortic regurgitation that, that is hitting the mitral valve or the anterior mitral leaflet, if we put an M mode here, we will know that there is a fluttering waves at the anterior mitral leaflet here and here indicating significant aortic regurgitation that is hitting the anterior mitral leaflet. 
moving from 2D and M mode to Doppler and we'll start with the color Doppler. So any jet, if looking at the jet from the perspective of color Doppler, then the jet has three components, flow conversion and then vena contractor and the jet area. Okay, so now we are interested in the vena contractor. By definition, the vena contractor is the narrowest area here or dimension where the flow passes through the valve. So this is the flow passing through the valve and the narrowest area is the vena contractor. And in case of aortic regurgitation and because we know that axial resolution is better than lateral resolution, we will measure it in parasternal long axis view. Okay, so if it is 0.3 or less than 0.3 is mild from 0.3 centimeter of course to 0.6 centimeter, this is moderate, more than 0.6 centimeter of vena contracta is considered severe. Now the good thing about vena contracta is load independent. So regardless of the blood pressure, uh, systemic blood pressure or the LVEDP, vena contracta will be accurate. Another parameter we can utilize in uh, color Doppler is the jet width over the LVOT diameter. So if we have a centrally directed jet, we can utilize uh, this parameter. So this is the jet area. So where we measure jet area? Is it here or here or here? So actually we should measure it. If we look carefully, we need to identify the vena contracta. So after we identify the vena contracta, proximal to vena contracta, 10 millimeter or one centimeter proximal to vena contracta, we measure this jet width. And at the same place, we measure the LVOT diameter and we check the ratio. If the ratio is less than 25%, this is mild, from 25 to 64%, this is moderate. 65% and more, this is severe. So again, it has to be measured this way, we, if we we don't need to measure or we cannot measure it distal here because as the flow passes distally, it will divert and then we will have more area. So we need to measure it exactly it was valid where it was validated. One centimeter proximal to the vena contracta and in a centrally directed jet. We can also use the area ratio, but the area ratio has different values, different reference values for normal and mild and moderate and severe. We, you can see it in the reference value table. Also, uh, we need a biplane guidance uh, for this measurement. Now moving to the pulse wave Doppler, uh, if we uh, place the sample volume in the descending aorta in the suprasternal window or abdominal aorta in the subcostal window, uh, we, will, we need to look for diastolic reversal and not any diastolic reversal, it has to be holodiastolic that starts with, with the early of diastole and continues until the end of diastole. So we call it holodiastolic flow reversal, which is abnormal. And the reason for that, because a normal individual, we can see it is possible to see a brief diastolic uh, reversal or early diastolic flow reversal. Okay, so if we see this holodiastolic flow reversal uh, in the descending thoracic aorta, it indicates at least moderate aortic regurgitation, at least moderate AI, maybe severe. 
if we see it in the abdominal aorta then it will indicate severe aortic insufficiency or regurgitation however we need to keep in mind that there are different reasons for a hollow diastolic flow reversal one of them is upper limb av fistula also rupture sinus uh, of valsalva all will cause uh, hollow diastolic flow reversal even patent ductus arteriosus can cause uh, this phenomena so we need to keep this in mind now cw doppler or continuous wave doppler so when we align our doppler uh, beam or cursor with a jet or aortic regurgitation jet in our an apical five chamber or an apical three chamber whichever will give us the best alignment we look at the shape of the of the jet regurgitation jet is it a complete envelope or incomplete is the jet is really weak to give us a complete uh, envelope it will indicate trivial aortic regurgitation and then we also look at uh, the density of the jet and we compare it with the forward flow so if the density is weak again it indicates mild aortic regurgitation if we have uh, more dense of uh, a jet compared with the forward flow similar maybe similar uh, density with a forward flow it indicates severe aortic regurgitation the other thing we look at is pressure half time and i think we have seen that on the hemodynamic lecture so we measure the pressure half time the steeper the steeper the pressure half time or the deceleration time uh, the more severe is aortic regurgitation so if this is the aorta and this is the lv so now if if the aorta will fill the lv quicker so it will be full quicker during diastole it means that aortic regurgitation is more severe so it will fill quickly and will stop so this is the reason why we, why we have uh, pressure half time more steep here and severe aortic regurgitation however we need to keep in mind some pitfalls here that pressure half time is really dependent on load on chronicity on lv size lv uh, diastolic pressure so it is really dependent on many things we need to keep this into consideration when we inter and interpret uh, pressure half time for example if you have this lv definitely it will take more time to fill with, from aortic regurgitation even if aortic regurgitation is severe than this lv so in acute it does not mean really anything does not mean severe or not in chronic again we can see uh, pressure half time in the moderate range but really it is severe aortic regurgitation now we will proceed to the quantitative assessment of aortic regurgitation in general nothing beats quantitative assessment in grading the severity of valve pathology whether regurgitation or stenosis so we have always to quantify uh, the severity of the valve disease whether stenosis or regurgitation particularly when we see uh, the valve pathology at least in the moderate range we have to do some quantitative assessment particularly the decision for surgery or intervention is dependent on the echocardiography report so in quantitation of aortic regurgitation we need to calculate the regurgitant volume the regurgitant fraction as well as the effective regurgitant orifice area regurgitant volume can be calculated either with a volumetric method or the effective regurgitant orifice area in the volumetric method 
we need a competent non-regurgitant valve, either the pulmonic valve or the mitral valve. A normal condition would, where, when there is no significant regurgitation in any valve, we expect that stroke volume through the pulmonic valve will equal the mitral, will equal also the aortic valve. But if we have a problem in aortic valve, there is aortic regurgitation here, then the stroke volume of aortic regurgitation will be, uh, or through the aortic valve, will be more. For example, if the aortic valve will send out 100 ml, that 100 ml, part of it will go back to the LV as a regurgitant jet, and the rest will go to the different size. So for example, if I calculate the pulmonic stroke volume to be 70, and the aortic valve stroke volume to be 100, the difference between them must be the regurgitant volume that went back. So only 70 will really go forward from the aortic valve and 30 will go back. For further details, you can always refer back to the hemodynamic uh, presentation. So in short, we need to condition. The valve has to be a uh, competent non-regurgitant valve, also uh, absence of shunt. The presence of shunt will only make it more difficult to calculate uh, the regurgitant volume. Now, the effective regurgitant orifice area method where we calculate the effective regurgitant orifice area first, and we do this by PISA, so we calculate it by PISA, and we will see how. Now we have the effective regurgitant orifice area. We have the area, so the area is in square centimeter. We need the volume, so we multiply that area by the VTI, which is in centimeter, the VTI of the aortic regurgitation flow, and then we will get the uh, regurgitant volume. Regurgitant fraction is the percentage of the regurgitant volume from the LVOT stroke volume, speaking of aortic valve. For example, this is the aortic valve, 100 is out, 30 is back. So the stroke volume is 100, out of this 130 went back. So the regurgitant fraction here is 30%. Now, the effective regurgitant orifice area can be calculated either with PISA or volumetric method or 3D vena contractor. Now, for effective regurgitant orifice area from the volumetric method, we assume that we are now already calculated the regurgitant volume. So let's assume regurgitant volume is 30 ml or 30 cubic centimeter, the same thing. And now we need to calculate the effective regurgitant orifice area, just in an opposite mat uh, manner of what we did to calculate the regurgitant volume, we will do here. So this is the reg regurgitation flow from the aortic valve. We just trace and calculate the VTI. VTI is in centimeter. Okay, so we divide this VTI, we divide the volume by this VTI, we will get the area in square centimeter. Similarly, if we multiply the area by the VTI, we will get the volume. The other way is uh, with a PISA. In PISA, the apical views are recommended, and we calculate, we decrease the Nyquist limit in the direction of the flow. So this is the direction of the flow. We decrease that flow that goes to that direction until we get a good hemisphere. Once we have a good hemisphere, regardless of this number, we stop and then we measure from the vena contracta here all the way 
to the end of the shell where the color switches from blue to red or yellow so this is for the radius and then uh, we uh, put it into the equation and we get uh, the effective regression and orifice area a small note is for the best accurate result when we measure this radius of the hemisphere if we note the timing on the ECG we have to use the same exact timing to calculate the peak velocity so if we use this area here as a peak velocity we will not get really an accurate uh, result because velocity here velocity times area equals velocity times area so this is velocity one that comes inside now the velocity that leaves at the same time is somewhere here we map it with the ECG and of course with the, uh, for further details you, you can always go back to the hemodynamic uh, a third way to estimate effective regurgitant orifice area is 3D vena contracta area. So uh, a 3D planimetry method can be used by aligning the orthogonal planes to cut through the vena contracta. Here. This is one plane another plane we cut through the vena contracta and then we measure the vena contracta area which is almost resembles or represent the effective regurgitant orifice area in this table taken from the guidelines we have reference value for mild aortic regurgitation, moderate aortic regurgitation, and severe aortic regurgitation. And also here you can see the jet area, which we talked about, less than 5% is considered mild, between 5 and 59 is moderate, and more than 60 or equal to 60 is in the severe range. Quantitative parameter which is most important here the regurgitant volume anything less than 30 is in the mild more than or equal to 60 in the severe range and in between is moderate range similarly we have the regurgitant fraction and the effective regurgitant orifice area now let's assume we have conflicting parameters of quantification regurgitant volume regurgitant fraction and effective regurgitant orifice area if we assume that the regurgitant volume is in the moderate range regurgitant fraction in the severe or maybe the effective regurgitant area is in the severe and the volume in the moderate so which one will win that conflict let me give you an example first let's assume that we have mitral stenosis so this is the mitral valve with severe mitral stenosis and it will fill the LV but, but because there is mitral stenosis the volume that it will fill the LV is small for example 50 ml so and we have at the same time severe aortic regurgitation okay so out of that 50 ml let's say 50 will come out of aortic valve and out of that 50 30 will go back inside will be regurgitant volume so the regurgitant volume is 30 is in the moderate range however if we calculate the regurgitant fraction here it will be 30 divided by 50 which is 60 percent so 60 percent is in the severe range we know that we have severe aortic regurgitation but because of the mitral stenosis the regurgitant volume is not in the severe range so still it is severe so a regurgitant fraction here 
will win the conflict, followed by regurgitant and volume, and finally the effective regurgitant orifice area. So number one, priority is for regurgitant fraction, for, which is number one, followed by regurgitant volume, and followed by the effective regurgitant orifice area. All that quantitative and semi-quantitative parameters are validated in chronic aortic regurgitation, but not in acute aortic regurgitation. In acute aortic regurgitation, we, re we really need to depend on the hemodynamics of the patient and the response of the patient. However, there is one sign that we can look in acute aortic regurgitation, which is the early closure of the mitral valve. Early closure of mitral valve is defined as the C point or closure point of the mitral valve before the onset of the QRS. So this is the onset of the QRS. So before that, any closure of the mitral valve is considered early closure of the mitral valve. And early closure of mitral valve has two types, A and B. In type A, it will occur after the A wave or after atrial contraction. So look at the P wave here. In B or type B of early closure of uh, mitral valve, it will occur in mid diastole before the P wave or the atrial contraction. So B is more severe than A. Finally, and to complete the assessment of the aortic valve, we will see how to present the aortic valve in 3D presentation. Simply, we just need to align the right coronary cusp. The RCC should be aligned at 6 o'clock position. Whether we are looking from the aorta down to the aortic valve or from the LVOT up to the aortic valve, the RCC or right coronary cusp has to be aligned at 6 o'clock. From the aortic view, if the right coronary cusp is at 6 o'clock, so that one here on the left will be the non-coronary cusp, and that one here is the left coronary cusp. The opposite is if we are looking from the LVOT perspective. Here is the non-coronary cusp, and here is the left coronary cusp, and of course, the right is always at 6 o'clock. Thank you for watching. The next lecture will be about the mitral valve.